Another star about like how did Joe Bean come to be? All right. Genesis. <laughs> Chapter one. Chapter one. <laughs> well, Mark has been um, doing musical direction for Bainbridge High School, uh, where I teach for uh, probably 14 years, God, 18 years. And we did an original play that he wrote called Little Boy Goes to Hell. So uh, we had planned, both of us love J.C. Superstar. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a kick-ass musical and has so much power. And yet it's, it's, it's not especially a happy feel-good because of course it ends in a crucifixion. Uh, <laughs> it fits our it fits our mode, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, we uh, we wanted to do JC Superstar. Mark was going to do vocals and music because we both love the show. And um, it, it, suddenly we couldn't get the rights. And it was what was it? First part of February? Or... Yeah, about, no, about well, three weeks to go. Three weeks to go. Yeah. So uh, before re before auditions. Before auditions, and right? Rehearsal starting and the week after that. God, yeah. And so I looked through every catalog we had. We looked through three lame dingbat yeah. musicals, remember? And there was one that I kind of liked the story, but Mark said, "Oh, the music sucks." The Wolverine Boy or something like that. Bat Boy. Bat Boy. Okay. Not to disparage that show, but it wasn't quite. Uh... Yeah. So uh, Mark said, "And why don't you take it, Mark, from this point?" Uh. I said, I think that this would go really well if, if you just pick your favorite story. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, he'd been teaching uh, Job for as long as you'd been in school, I think you told yeah, me about. Since like 68. Your, since your first year or whatever. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then also doing JB, which is a 1956 Pulitzer Prize winning yeah, 52, I think. 52. Yeah. Yeah, so very, very 50s, uh, but very poetic and, and brilliant. Uh, Archibald McLeish. Archibald McLeish. Yeah. And so uh, he said, check this this play out and read the read Job, and let's see how it goes from there. And so uh, I read JB, and I just thought, no, I can't do it. Too depressing. Um, and heavy, and heavy, so heavy, and it just wasn't the kind of music that I felt I could write. So I just sat down and uh, just started, just cranked out about, well, basically just outlined it really quick with Bob, you know, and just said, you know, I think this is, this is the, the outline of the, the, uh, the show in terms of what I think are songs. And then, um, then busted out the, the, uh, the first set of lyrics which didn't include a lot of the the newer really great songs I think but ba basically just just put that together in about a week and I think we cast that the end of that week and had a reading the next day or something I mean it was literally like about a week for that yeah. first draft yeah and uh and then the song we had like four songs that were ready pretty much the music we had two songs we two had songs, suicide yeah. and i picked the the two most uh, edgy songs i think yeah um so i think it was one? i think the other one was friendly was it friendly fire and suicide god yeah. yeah um and and put those together first uh and mainly that was to sell the kids on it because i really felt um that they were sort of in my same mindset bob has a high tolerance for for uh heavy literature and and that the kids tend to get into it but not right away it takes yeah. them a while so i thought i thought that this would be a great ex opportunity for them to sort of be blown away by how different than their preconceived notions of that story this could be yeah. uh so and both of us kind of enjoy that as well like just completely blasting something uh, <laughs> uh out of the from one place to another place. And so, yeah, The Suicide God is the, probably one of the funkiest, you know, where jo uh, Joe, oh, that was the other thing along the way, Job became uh, Joe Bean, 
for the just the the phonetic reasons um average joe a bean as yeah. you said yeah. many times is like a perfect yeah. seed a dna structure yeah uh it's transferable um like an everyman kind of guy so yeah so those are the first two songs and then i think you know the character of joe just evolved uh into someone that we really love yeah and it um i was thinking about this on the way over yeah today if jesus were around today mm -hmm. he certainly wouldn't be at the country clubs he'd be down in the streets and he'd be talking to the guys on heroin the women that are drunk on wine and all the people that have that that pain within them are trying somehow to make it through life and what's what's nice is uh the, the i think as the play has grown do you remember that one conversation we had uh you know the song about joe seeing joe what is that uh, joe bean's been seen joe bean's been seen yeah and we started talking after uh We'd, you'd written the music for it and we were talking about it and you said I suddenly realized this is about everyone that we come into contact with who needs something to keep going it's all and about the bums it is by God because <laughs> as you know the, the prophets yeah. and the the um, religious apostles have always said yeah. and where does Mother Teresa work she worked in Calcutta, yeah. And where did where did Gandhi go? And who did Jesus hang out with? Mm -hmm. And it certainly wasn't the CEOs. Not that we wouldn't really enjoy some money from CEOs, but well, that's, and, that's and not... the nice thing too is that that uh, there are plenty of people out there, and we found one who has a huge interest in giving it away. Giving what away? Money. God, isn't that astounding? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, to the right causes, to these yeah. kind of causes. Yeah, and it's a quality of the heart because yeah. every one of us is Joe Bean. And I began to realize mm -hmm. that more and more and more in every way, every one of us is Joe Bean. Mm -hmm. And I remember that, I told you that story about my dad. Yeah. Who And it's this whole idea of the oscillation in our existence that we go through. It's anyone that is, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. You know, that's straight from the New Testament. And it's, it's the way of it. It's the way we're born and the way that we die. And in between, something happens. Yeah. That can be enormously enlightening or it can be enormously <laughs> depressing. Mm. But that's, that's why I have always, um, for me, the depressing stuff is not depressing because it's, it's what is. Right, and so Hamlet for me is not depressing. Mm. I mean, yeah, it dies at the end, but look what kind of spiritual growth he goes through. Yeah, and I think that's what happens to Joe. Mm -hmm. You got to step into the furnace in order to feel the fire, and then see if you can yeah. somehow survive. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, real quickly, you want to talk about your dad's story? Oh yeah, uh, our family. My dad was very rich. I have a another one-man show about this um, that if you're interested in, you know, you can contact me and make some money. And in fact, I think the really big will probably get involved. Oh, thank you. I know, it's the problem with gestures. Okay, sorry. No, that's not uh, No, it's okay. I'll just stop that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just it's right here. It's going to go boom. It's yeah. The bass drum. I know, I know. Thank you. I mean, because they can't see the, your hand. It'll be right. more what the hell it is. Okay. They're done now. Somebody was doing some weird car key okay well uh, yeah the throw it. Are good. yeah yeah I, I like think the it's birds. fine okay. cool okay. Uh, so my dad uh, enormously rich uh, we lived next door to Bill Boeing from the time I was 10 to about 14 uh, he got uh, he he tried to retire um, and start a fishing resort up in La Push and there was a scam artist who really cheated him out of all the money that he had made uh, for the past 40 years uh, he'd been building up and this was a man that went through the depression and rather than declare bankruptcy he uh, paid off all of his debts but in the process he suffered what they called back then a nervous breakdown and I used to wake up in the morning and hear him in the shower 
uh, praying and crying. And um, he, it, it was a blow. He, we went from uh, eating steak, and I'm talking about food because it was so important for a 13 or 14 year old boy, and with three brothers living at home. But we suddenly went to uh, meatloaf. Uh, we had horse meat, a uh, lot of potatoes. And I learned how many things you could put ketchup on and still make it okay to eat. So that's, that's I, and I didn't realize that, that my fascination from Job really did come from what happened to my father and that enormous fall that we took. And in retrospect, you know, as it is with any experience that we go through, um, good things came from it. Hmm. I, I wouldn't be the same person that I, that I am if that had not happened. Mark, did this story grab you too, or did you just? Well, what I re realized really, really quickly was that this is the perfect kind of story for an opera. Uh, in that every scene is a high stakes scene, and yeah. um, the f so there's a lot to, to say about it in terms of the process. I mean, that was just the beginning in terms of the first actual draft what what happened really quickly is that we started collaborating on this intense schedule like to the point where he was getting out of class <coughs> driving over here listening to a song making notes going back to class i'd do two more songs he'd come back or i'd go over to his house and we listen to he's got a great sound system in the truck so that was kind of the <laughs> yeah. the the haven you know where i'd listen to two or three songs every night for 10 days i think this, yeah and what was great is sometimes Mark would call me about you know, 10, 10.30 at night and I'd say hello and he said, God, you got to listen to this. And then he'd turn on the stereo in the background, which of course sounded <laughs> like kind of Tin Pan uh, Alley with deaf ears. And uh, I'd, I'd listen to the record and it was just amazing. <laughs> and then, uh, God, it's, I mean, was there ever a time when I said, no, that doesn't work. I mean, I was just blown no. away. No, that was one of the nice things that you were, that's part, a huge reason this, this was actually came together is because of the fact that you kept saying, yes, go for it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. This and I don't, theater and, games, yeah. you know, yes, and I don't yes, lie. Yes. I, I tell the truth. I mean, if I would have thought the song wasn't right, I would, but every one just hit me, hit me, hit me. I mean, it was like we were tuned into some kind of yeah. chord, yeah. Some, some sort of, and that's what, uh, Joe Bean is about this universal consciousness, right. which I think exists, absolutely, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it says yeah. the same thing to so many people. And when we tap into it, um, magic happens. Hmm. So Bob, you can repeat this, but did your words precede Mark's music, or what was that flow? I think the music always came. F well, wasn't that a combo played? I mean, sometimes, like at the very beginning, you had both the words and the music. There were yeah. times, but usually, towards the end there, I'd get... Yeah, it changed greatly over the yeah. time. Because I think at the beginning, I just slammed through it. Like, it wasn't really um, kind of like thought out at all. And that, that was... I mean, there was... And then what it would be would be... And then, uh, then I mean, it was such a tight schedule that I... Like for Where Were You, for example, which is the first time I'd ever uh, even worked with Bob on music. Uh, basically, I said, I can't deal with this scene. Oh, yeah. right. This this thing is in, insanely huge. I can't deal with the ideas of it. I have no idea where to start. That was the Where Were You when I created the Heavens and the Earth speech from the Bible. And I said, just write, and then just give me the lyrics. So that was that was pretty much the main... Thing. Yeah. And that turned out to be the best song in the first version, I think. And everybody yeah. else, I think, thought I so, that too. Song. I mean, that, just in terms of just... And uh, and literally, Bob gave me the lyrics. I sat down. The first version I recorded on the piano was the one that we gave to the cast. It was just straight through. Didn't even think about it. And then my computer crashed after that. So that was it. <laughs> I didn't want to redo it because I thought it had too many kind of 
kind of subtle. You know, I was just trying to sound but like God, Bob it Dylan. was great from the beginning. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was great from the beginning. Yeah, and so it, it's basically stayed the same. Uh, and then after that, I think every song after that pretty much, well, not exactly, but most of the songs after that have been Bob's uh, poetry and then me just kind of tweaking it here and there and then putting it to to music. So so it's kind of like the the... I was thinking of this the other day. The first ten percent, or first ninety percent of this play, was was written really spontaneously in about two to three weeks, and then now we've been working on that last ten percent, including all exactly. the new, all the new right. lyrics and songs for yeah. a whole year, almost yeah. straight. Uh, you know that includes production for the for the CD and all that stuff. But um, yeah, it's been just such a huge process. God, <clears throat> sorry. Remember that one time I said. Give me a melody and remember that, and you never did. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really hard. I don't think it's ever happened that way. It just. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the music part of it to me comes from the lyrics, ninety nine percent of yeah. the time, and it's usually not even thought out. It just, it's the first thing I sing is what ends up going, becoming the song. Like wide space between words. I'd sung it through once and just played it, improved it basically. And then Jennifer came over and was listening to this God. this thing, and it was really hard to tell what the heck was going on. Like she'd say, "What note is that right there?" And I said, "I think that's a, you know, I think it goes up right there." You know, it was like, you know, literally, it was like trying to discern somebody else's music for her. Like I just was like, I can't figure this out. You know. <laughs> anyway, so so uh, that's that's pretty much the way it went. I think just having to get the tapes done for the kids as simply yeah. as possible was what kind of kept this thing real and balanced and simple and kind of so that it would just kind of hit and also trying to impress the kids actually was such a huge thing for me or at least to I, get them to buy into it to buy into it right. yeah 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 and that's where the rap and the yeah and the comedy and stuff a lot of it came from was just like no nah, there's no way that i'm going to be able to write a song about the all the kids dying you know yeah. like where they talk about the kids dying so that became this sort of really black dark uh comedy tango where they're watching their own funeral with no words yeah. really yeah um so 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 much of it was to try and make it softer on them you know but at the same time what ended up happening i think was that it left so many holes for poetry, you know, that that's where it kind of became, started yeah. to become like really poetic and, yeah. and like, and we realized, wow, we've got something that's like this amazing, it has this potential to be literary, you know, don't you know you think? I mean, yeah, I do. The, the, the space in it was what was really pretty amazing. Yeah, that's why it was so great to do it once where it had to be, we had to do it in such a frenzy. Yeah, and then we can go back and visit it again, the yeah. following year. Yeah, and start honing and shaping. God lies in the details, <laughs> as Doctor Johnson said. Yeah, yeah, I think that was Johnson. Maybe it was Einstein. I think it's Doctor Johnson. I think it was the devils in the details originally. The devil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, which brings up a whole another question yeah. about this play, yeah. and that is how it be, has transformed over time from the story of God and the devil making a bet to, to test a man's faith to what it's become. Right, which is the story of Joe Bean. And you know what? That exactly replicates what happens if you take about 100,000 years of literary history. You start off with a focus on the gods, and by the time we get to the Greeks, we've got uh, divine kings and individuals that are very heroic and kind of superhuman that approach the gods. The gods become very human. And then by the time we had Shakespeare, we've got Falstaff, who is, who is a, a, a lower class person, but he is a hero and he possesses noble qualities that, that um, are, are reflective of, of God and of angels and of devils. Yeah. And so the whole, the whole pattern, what we've done really is we've relived 
uh, the history of, of, of literature, which goes from God, and that's what we should concentrate upon, to uh, singular human beings in the quotidian world, living within the demands of having to get up in the morning and go to work, having to figure out what am I going to do with the kids this afternoon, and mm -hmm. how am I going to make enough money so that I can keep on eating, and what yeah. the hell is it about gas prices, and hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, and how, how do we live through that? And so it's, yeah, it speaks to everyone. Yeah, but at the same time, um, when I was thinking of... Uh, Joe being in that first kind of time, I was yeah. really con I was thinking that he was Native American. And yeah. the reason behind that was the Native Americans that I know, I grew up near the Lummi tribe in uh, the far corner of the United States. It's probably the last one before the border. Uh, it's a big tribe and um, they, and I actually uh, got to know a guy from the from the tribe, and and uh, I actually wrote Joe with a Native American spirituality f for foremost in mind, and uh, the idea behind that, as far as I can, as far as I understand, is that uh, every person, animal, and thing as we know them, we meaning the settlers, uh, is perceived differently in the Native American consciousness as a spirit being. And so Joe Bean, uh, right from the beginning of the play, begins to see the whole world and every person in it as a spirit being. And that was kind of realized through these characters we call the gods, you know, there was God and the devil, which are really important characters to me uh, because I grew up with them as the primary mytholo mythological and uh, religious and sacred symbols or entities that I see. And then, but also that he's, that he's, everybody he sees is sort of this masked creature in disguise and that there's a grand conspiracy sort of happening to him. Um, so that was kind of like the, I don't know, that's pretty intense, but like the religious, yeah. like the spiritual and religious background behind Joe Bean to me. And I'm sure you have different takes on it, which kind of makes it really interesting. You know, they well. really, um, they supplement what you're saying and going back to this idea of, of, um, how the world continues in the same sorts of patterns. The Hindus, you know, the Native American and the idea of the spirit world, it goes right back to the Hindu who said there's a part of, of God in everything and everyone and all creatures. And so the spirit world, the eternal, lives in everyone. And then we get in about 1920 to 1960, modern physics saying that, that well, no, we go right back to Kepler. Or Newton, his third law, which says uh, nothing is ever created or destroyed. In the, whatever it is, whether it's four and a half billion or six billion years, the universe was here and the universe is still here. Nothing mm -hmm. has disappeared, even black holes, which mm -hmm. is another thing that Stephen Hawking introduced. But the important thing is, is that what was here at the very beginning is here right now. It's just in a different shape. And so whatever gods there were, whatever gods have been, they are still here. It's just different formations of matter. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Every, and it's Hamlet <laughs> staring into the, yeah. the skull and imagining that Caesar yeah. once was part of that. And yeah. so we take a drink of water and we're, we're taking in human beings and spirits. Mm -hmm. And the world as it has existed for four and a half billion years. Nothing mm -hmm. has ever not been added. Lost or... It, yeah, nothing has been lost or gained. Yeah. And the way these spirits incarnate in Joe Bean is as bums, more or less. Like, they, they incor incarnate mostly as people that are misunderstood or that are on the outside looking in, so to speak. Uh, so it's great to see the 
you see them at the beginning and you see them at the end and they've gone through the whole story with him watching participating and being aware of his his story um you know so that's one of the really cool and they too are transformed uh, by the story right yeah unexpected because i think we both believe in mm -hmm. this the sacred story it's what human beings again have been doing yeah. for yeah at least 150,000 years well the idea that this play is one that gets repeated over and over so that the gods learn from humans yeah um is a really interesting idea i talked to an iranian friend of mine and he said i told him the story and he didn't know it uh, hmm. he was right i haven't told you this but he said oh yeah that's java and i said what <laughs> <laughs> and he awesome. described the story of a wow. guy who was very rich and prosperous and happy and then Suddenly he's slung down to the bottom of a pit and he doesn't have anything and no way to escape. And what does he do? Yeah. But he knew it immediately. I mean, that story exists in every culture yeah. and in every religion. Because well, didn't you tell me that it was the possibly the oldest story in the book? That's what Cynthia Ozick says uh, and Northrop Fry. And Northrop Fry is probably the biblical scholar. And yes, the, the agreement is it's the oldest one. And it, it it was probably first told, according to most scholars, about 4,000 years before the year zero, however you want to say it. I don't know what the PC is now, but we used to call it uh, 4,000 BC, which places it 6,000 years ago. That yeah. story was told, and if, it was, if we know about it being told, then it had to have been told before. Yeah. And, you know, it's the Joseph Campbell, which mm -hmm. we certainly dipped into his... Mm -hmm. uh, magic uh, Stole. saying that what there are ten Just stories. Just blatantly ripped him off. <laughs> yeah, completely. Yeah, there are ten <laughs> stories. Campbell says, or twelve, but it's it's very not very many, and we just keep mm -hmm. on having different variations. On mm -hmm. And he's right. Yeah, he's right. Yeah, our masks are only masks revealing deeper meaning. Yes, incarnate. We are simply you. That was that was actually from sitting down and watching. Bob's collection of uh, this. Oh, the Man and Myth. Or? Man and Myth. Joseph yeah, the Campbell. Myth. Yeah, right. the famous. Uh, <coughs> yeah. PBS series. Yeah, with Joseph Campbell. Watched the whole darn thing that week too. Uh, <laughs> but it was yeah, gosh, it yeah. was great to to have such a rush. And then of course when the show got performed, well, first off, the first thing we realized is the kids are really into this. They were listening to the music all the time. And um, it just seemed to come together really, really quickly and easily, you know, to the point of uh, it was truly a fun process. And I think after it, there was a point when they really didn't like it, but then there was a point when they really did like it. And all of a sudden people started saying things like, whoa, I think this is going to be really good. You know, yeah. it, it went from a serious mistrust <laughs> for obvious reasons, new show they didn't have a script to begin with. We were slapping songs on them. <clears throat> I was, you know, coming to rehearsal and like our, our, the great dancer in the cast, uh, I mean, there are many of them good dancers, but this, this guy was, um, Vince, uh, Palazzo. Pal yeah. Um, basically showed up for rehearsal having had the song for two days and, kind of halfway sang, sang through it and I said to him you know you've got to put something into it and he didn't seem to get what I was saying so I just started yelling at him I just said you know you've got to you've got to go at it like ah! and I just yelled right in his face about this close to his face and he he kind of went and and I, for two days after that, I heard rumors that he was going to quit I hate you know yeah. and then he was just like didn't know what to do and then about three days after that, he showed up, I think, to one of these rehearsals or something. Here, right here, right? Was it here? <sighs> no, I think it was on stage. I saw oh, okay. him I saw him just do the whole song yeah. fully the way it was yeah. going to be at the yeah. end. And it was, you Not know, it. I mean, yeah. basically the guy was on fire. Yeah. And uh, so there were that kind of, those kind of things happened all through the show, you know. Um, 
you know, all through the rehearsal process, which was about four weeks or something, God, five weeks. Yeah, and, it's amazing. You know, um, and when we opened, you know, people were coming up and saying, this is really, really good. And I was just like, oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. No, I mean, this is really good. And I'd kind of go, hmm. After a while hearing that, you kind of go, huh. And so I started asking people if they would participate further, you know, if they yeah. had a, the op opportunity. And uh, one woman that came up to me, didn't even know her, said that. And I said, well, why don't you do the meeting and we'll get together and we'll, do, we'll start the Joe Bean support group. Was that Alice? Yeah, it was yeah. Alice. And she happened to be, I guess, the ex-mayor of Bainbridge yeah. or something yeah. like that. And happened to be this like super dynamic leader and mm -hmm. got just the right people together. And that's where we, we met our, our uh, investor for the show and, and um, all these incredible people from the community who... Yeah, and then Dee Eisenhower did a couple of the, sh the songs at her church service. I think she did two weeks at least. Yeah. On the well, Book of was... Job and got kids in mm -hmm. to uh, sing the songs. Oh, and Dee is uh, the pastor of, is that what you want? The pastor of uh, Eagle Harbor Congregational Church and also one of the prime backers. Is that right? Is that the right church? Yeah, Eagle yeah. Harbor Congregational. And also one of the prime backers, along with her husband John, of the show. And those people have been amazing because in all of the incarnations of the show and all during the rehearsal process, Never did we hear, you know, I think you had to do it differently. It was always just this amazing gift Positive. of, yeah, you, you guys are doing it and go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and working on, with us two, who are definitely <coughs> on the edge in terms of spiritual and religious subject matter, that takes a lot of guts, I think. Boy, you yeah. know, I mean, what, the first show we did was Little Boy Goes to Hell together. Yeah. You know, which yeah. the main character was the, the devil who had a, you know, a scene where he was dressed in blackface. <laughs> right. Yeah. And th there's also a scene where he's got a naked Barbie doll and he's putting <laughs> shit cushions in. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we've sent, we've since kind of grown up a little bit. Yeah. So are you on the edge? <laughs> Maybe. Are you on the edge? Well, you know what? It, you for me, center? it's not, it's, it's far center. as it's on the edge against, I guess, uh, conservative, strict girdle girdled values that don't admit of an ecumenical point of view and a tolerance for other religious beliefs and ways of seeing the world we're extremely prejudiced about that we want to get rid of these people kidding <laughs> i'm kidding <laughs> no no i think i think what it goes to is I, I, I don't think i've told you this but when i was 15 i was put on probation for stealing up caps and so my punishment was I had to go to church, uh, or my probation, part of my probation was having to go to church every Sunday. Hmm. So regardless if I was sick as a dog, I mean, my mom would make me go to church and, uh, I was, I did that for a year. Hmm. And so finally in the spring or summer when I'd already done like nine months and I had to get a, a signature from the pastor that I attended church. Somehow I would be a better person because I'd gone to church. Yeah. Uh, I I skipped out of church before the collection came. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd already gotten the signature from the Rev. And I went down to Mrs. Benz's soda fountain. And it was one of those old soda fountains. And uh, I sat down at the chair and Mrs. Benz was uh, behind the counter and she was washing dishes. Mrs. Benz was just this lovely woman and I don't know she's maybe in her 60s with a plastic hairnet on and an apron mm -hmm. and it was one of those white and you know marble uh, uh, counters and she was humming beautiful dreamer when I came in you know that mm -hmm. song and I came in and I said hi Mrs. Bems you know I was I was wearing my nice little corduroy ch church going jacket and yeah. white shirt and she said hi and I said what can I get you and I took out my 25 cents, and I said, I'd like a strawberry sundae, please. And she fixed it, and she fixed a double portion. Because <laughs> you know, all I had was a quarter. And uh, it was giant strawberry sundae, so I sat there eating it, feeling you know vaguely guilty because it was collection money meant for the church. Mm -hmm. but And I was skipping out. 
but I ate it and Mrs. Benz uh, was back there against the mirror and she looked at me and she said, you know, if I had had a boy, I'd want him just like you. And I realized something about it. I was in something more holy hmm. at that point than I could have gotten from church. Hmm. In other words, church and being religious and having faith in each other and knowing something about the world that happens now. It certainly doesn't happen only in church, that it's possible hmm. in the living of our lives. Yeah. Yeah, I hadn't told you that. Yeah. And it was a strawberry Sunday. Yeah. Sunday, you know. Well, you're pretty much preaching every day to the kids and in your own yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, it's it's a whole, it's just a different way of looking at what what is a church. Right. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. uh, um, you know, I grew up, my, the, the ability to write music comes from me sitting in church every single weekend my entire childhood. Uh, seriously, because that's where I, wow. I first learned how to harmonize. And the way we learned how to harmonize, and I say we because it was me, my brother, and my friend Nate, and sometimes his brother used to sit behind our football coach. I was tone deaf and trying to imitate him. And because uh, he, he would basically sing, uh, and it wasn't just tone deaf, but he would actually sing um, flat fives, like the whole melody in a flat five, which if is the devil's interval. And so I became very interested in the, what dissonance means and like would sing along and li literally the, we would try to sing against the, the, the music. Wow. And, uh, and that's where I started to realize what harmony could be because sometimes you'd hit these things it would be just like, wow, profound. And, and Lutheran music is also notoriously, uh, what's the word? It, it's a, uh, harmonic like they it's i don't know they, they actually embrace this sort of uh, this, is it polyphony? yeah but it, it's also it's it's got a really stylized sense of melody to it or in harmony to it like if and i'd have to take me a while to really describe it but but for example you know, you you'd be it actually worked a lot of this stuff because because the the harmonies are pretty rich, it's really good musicians and a lot of musicians yeah. from the west from the Midwest. Yeah, you know, okay. create the material. I, I went to a Lutheran church too. Did you? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know this. Our thing. Redeemer's Lutheran Church. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. you you know this thing. I mean, there's it's a really heavy music culture. Yeah. Uh, it's not gospel. It's it's not. Cap, it's not strict uh, musically at all. It's not old fashioned. It's new. It's modern, but it's, it's, it's got this sort of D minor nine, yeah. Yeah. you know, D minor with an E, you know, kind of a feel to it. I'd have to sit down at a piano to show you what I mean, but you'd laugh, you know, because <laughs> it's. Uh, but anyway, so a lot of a lot of the stuff that, um, like in the theater and all that stuff comes from sitting in church and going, God. I do this so much better theatrically yeah you know hey would you tell the story about your mom and uh, i'm going to step outside just for a second but tell the story about your mom and why you write uh low voice songs for females <laughs> that's interesting well that happened actually uh, after joe bean we were standing outside talking with a couple of friends, and this friend of mine, he's known me for a long time, and has been in a couple of plays, was in Little Boy Goes to Hell and everything, said, hey, do you realize that you're a sick guy? Um, and I said, you're, that you're sick, you're insane. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, you, uh, <clears throat> you probably don't even realize it, but all your mother characters are the deepest altos that <laughs> you, can't, you can't like write songs any lower for women. Kind of thought about it and went, yeah, it's totally right. Like, and and it's really nice, like, in this particular version to have Carla Torgerson, who's uh, sings for a band called The Walkabouts, who I've known since about 1987, um, and I did a lot of their string arrangements for years and went to Europe. They were, they're, they're really. Um, well known in Europe and 
not so well known in the United States, except now in Seattle, everybody knows them pretty, pretty well. Um, but uh, she is considered a really world class singer, and you can really hear it. And also a really great, great collaborator. So I was really lucky to have her um, sing the mom part because one, she has a low voice and she can pull it off. And uh, I was just talking about Carla. Oh yeah. Well. So I'm assuming your mom has a low alto. Well, I about. think what that comes from is um, my mom had a huge, huge musical influence on me because she was she comes from a family that was really, really uh, music appreciate appreciative. Um, and I think when I was a kid, she was collecting records like mad children's records for some reason she just had you know she had this like ability to have music that was real story music there all the time and also i think probably the low voice thing comes from your earliest memories of your mom and the distance that she is from your ear and the fact that they tend to sing quiet and so for me low equals quiet sometimes so the the idea of somebody whispering a song is really, really appealing. And when you whisper a song, it tends to be better if you're down in your lower register. And I think that's really why the moms have such low songs is because they tend to have the, the slow songs in the shows. You want another mom story? Yeah. I think I've told her this, maybe. but um, And I think it has something to do with a sad story that can become a happy story. You know, the way the world is dark and light and... We have a left hand and a right hand, and we see with binocular vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching, and uh, I, I'd gone through um, teaching Lord of the Flies, which is one of the most amazing comments on the dark side of human nature. And I came home, and uh, something else had happened. It could have been a divorce, <laughs> but I was I was depressed. And I turned on Channel 9, and they were having a special on Coney Island. Hmm. And uh, this is true historically. Um, Jumbo, uh, the biggest elephant in the world at that time, that was at Coney Island. And somebody uh, had fed Jumbo uh, a cigarette, and Jumbo thought it was a peanut. And it, and it was malicious. He gave him a cigarette, and Jumbo snorted it, and then slammed oh. his trunk against the guy breaking his ribs and injuring him so they had to put Jumbo away and so they decided to have a public hanging of Jumbo. Oh. Do you know this story? No. Yeah. Keep, keep they talking. decided to have a public hanging and they, they had pictures, footage, black and white, mm -hmm. of this giant scaffold and then uh, someone protested and said, no, you can't do this, it's too cruel. At the time, then, um, the fascination, it was in 1908, I think, the fascination was with electricity. And uh, so they determined to electrocute Jumbo. And they built this giant iron grid, and they, they raffled off. Um, a, a, the winning ticket got to pull the electric lever that then mm -hmm. would electrocute Jumbo. And they have footage of the handler taking Jumbo out and trying to get him on the grid. And uh, the handler quitting right in the middle of it because he couldn't go through it. And uh, people from the back jabbing Jumbo with sticks. And he finally went on the grid. And you see the, the newsreel footage shows the camera zooming in on Jumbo's f face. as And it shows a woman pulling the switch. And you see Jumbo like a mountain slowly collapsing onto the grid. And then it zooms in on Jumbo's face dead and I, I was watching that and I thought god I mean it was so depressing to think about what people hmm. can do in this world and to this world and then um, afterwards they switched to another manifestation of electricity at that time which was dreamland oh, and right. dreamland was this enormous uh, electrical lit and it had you know, something like 240,000 lights on it and people would go there and they would meet and especially sweethearts would go there hmm. and I got this full memory coming back into my head 
we never forget anything it's always there the full memory was of my mother hmm. leaning down to me when i was four or five maybe or six and she would always sing meet me tonight in dreamland hmm. you know that song mm -hmm. yeah can you sing just a little bit do you meet me tonight in dreamland under a silver moon or something like that and as i was watching i suddenly realized wow i thought all the time my mom was you know singing me a song about she would be there during my dreams but then i thought no this is based on something very real that exists and i i had it i had it both ways and so there was a balancing out from that just enormously depressing thing about jumbo mm. to getting the full memory of my mom <laughs> and it um and yet also, I mean, I know my mom meets me in my dreams and I've met her because she's not here anymore, but I still see her hmm. and she will be as long as I'm alive. And, and yet it's also about a real place. Hmm. And so something that I was imagining that I thought was part of a, a fantasy or some sort of dream state was in reality something that existed hmm. and does exist, hmm. which is kind of like Joe Bean. Is yeah. a fragment or a figment of of your imagination, of my imagination, of our thinking for mm -hmm. these what, what's it been now? Two years? Is that right? No, it's, it's a year, year and a half. Year. year and a half. But he still he exists. Mm -hmm. Not only on paper or in the music, but he's yeah. out there. He's yeah. there. Well, it's great. You were telling me the other day that that. Uh, you throw it on and kids that weren't in the show are singing it like if you put it on at school yeah. or whatever yeah i think that's kind of cool yeah and i had a kid come by and say i heard joe bean this morning made me feel so good <laughs> yeah and then when i play it uh in class kids that aren't in the show they know the lyrics yeah. and there's they're singing that they've got it by heart yeah it's so astounding yeah it is yeah a very lucky thing to have been able to do this show as a new work with like 16, 15, eight year, 18 year olds. Um, they're just so much easier to work with on new material. They, they didn't, they, they don't have the, the formed opinion yet that they're owed anything. Uh, so basically you can, you can just do whatever you want with them as long as the show gets done and they don't seem to really care too much about what happens and so therefore it's not painful at all it was really easy because I worked on a lot of new shows and it can be really painful when the actors are like well I haven't seen my script yet and you know I don't have any lines and I'm going on tonight stuff like yeah. that yeah. and so like it's okay to write songs in the last five minutes before the curtain opens because they don't expect anything else did that happen uh pretty much oh yeah yeah I mean um I'd say that some of the songs came a week before, and yeah. I, I know we put we threw on the backup vocals. We had some taped backup vocals that we put on like the night before, and um, it was actually the most complete show I think that I've ever done on opening night in terms of like being ready. It was really ready. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean there was, you know, there, we were stretching people to the absolute limit. And, um, they, at least they never talked to us about it. Well, even with the procast, remember they they kid us, and then we as we'd come to like a rehearsal, even in between shows, and say, "Here's a new page of script." Yeah, and you know that that was actually more extreme. Uh, and to give them credit, the new cast, the adult cast that that really got the whole CD together and the, and the and the show during the summer, um, you know, they were learning learning songs before you know, five minutes before, yeah. uh, the, before we had to leave the stage, uh, to get ready in the audience coming in. I mean, uh, for yeah. example, Joe Bean's been seen. I could not get that. I couldn't get the melody right on that thing. And, um, so every night I'd play the different chords as the guy, and he never asked like, how come that's different tonight than last night? <laughs> he would just kind of like roll with it and just, yeah. Ronald Campbell, the guy who played the, uh, um, he, you know, he sang a lot of the, the sort of old world God, that's what we called him, something like that, songs. And uh, 
Julie Lewis uh, <laughs> was they were literally learning songs uh, five minutes before the house opened yeah. almost almost every night that we performed but uh, I don't know that's where you get to the point where if you get good enough people then they as well are, are flexible like EJ um, Herod for example who plays God uh, you know, now that character has changed quite a bit, so we're not sure what we're calling him, but he's the guy who sings the Where Were You When I Created All of This For You song. And uh, he, uh, he kind of on the extreme opposite end is so good that, that he did it completely differently every night. Um, and we ended up having these kind of stage moments where, because that triggers something in me I have a, that same kind of impulse to jump off a cliff uh, when I get on the edge kind of thing. And so so we'd come up to this part and where were you? And I'd like stop completely and the band would, and then I'd sort of play a few things and he'd be like, what's going on? And then he'd take off on on this amazing tangent. You remember that? Yeah, How it was yeah. like completely different every night. Yeah. And sometimes it was Great. a different speed and it would go on for a long, 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 long time or he'd forget it whole verse and then we'd have to like cut to a different place and then cut back and get it yeah. and so that that was super fun uh, and super um you know every every actor is so totally different and i think a jennifer who can do a song like five times and nail it every time you yeah. know uh like he sings wide space between words um and uh a couple other things like that you know it's like uh Pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, I never heard that song without thinking, God, it's perfect. Like, <laughs> she couldn't do it any better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, every time she did it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Questions? So two things I'm thinking of while you're both here yeah. is to talk about how the story is still changing a little bit. Oh, okay. And, and yeah. at what point you think it locks in or is it just the type of thing that runs itself again? And should we run into that part about the future? Or? Yeah. Would that be good? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. We'll just start from... You have a new opening now, even since the change. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, at the very beginning, we're in a market, and there's a guy on the street, and his name is Joe Bean. And um, he's having a tough time. He's living a tough life. And he goes down to Tenzing Momo, which is a great name, but it's also a drugstore, right, that you know about. You and Brian Finney used to go Yeah, there. it's a it's yeah. a real store in the market yeah. that uh, is, well, their, their slogan is, if it were easy to buy here, everybody could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're herbs, and, and they do tarot readings and stuff like that. And a good friend of mine used to work there, and so... They're they're a pretty interesting place, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so anyway, so um, Joe goes in. You know, he needs he's trying to find what anybody needs at a drugstore or something to help him get through stuff. And uh, the druggist says you got to get a new mantra. Um, and uh, then the mantra starts this chant and. Uh, the world, probably the, the best analogy is we go from Kansas into Oz. What was monochromatic and what was gray and filled with dirt and trash suddenly transforms into a, a, a cathedral. Uh, uh, the gods appear, um, the masks are put on, the world transforms, the scene shifts. As, as Joe taps into what could be a previous life, what could be a universal consciousness, what could be um, real, real, absolutely, and all of that we leave equivocal, because all the world is possibility, and that's when the gods arrive, and that's that's the big change, mm -hmm. as I see it. And then, as we've talked about, at the end he's back, he's back in the same place that he began, and as Anne suggested, it all occurs within the blink of a second. Yeah, and we talked about you know that Ambrose Bierce's short story, 
about the guy who lives three days in the time that it takes his rope to go taut after he steps off the bridge. Have I given you that short story? Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, the Currents at Owl Currents at Owl Creek Bridge, right. And so um, then the story is there, and Joe is is living the high life. And he, and then, you know, it's it, ultimately the arc of his life is is the base, but how we get into that is another question. Yeah. And I think, I love that. I don't think. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's perfect. And so we're getting to this point, really, where the the play is set, and we need to get that because yeah. what, what we're interested in is getting other people to produce it. And we thought at first about doing just exclusively our production, but one quickly realizes, and I should, you know, I mean, both of us know mm -hmm. that what you want to do is take original material and do your own take on it. Do it do a, a variation on it, it create it anew yeah. because that's a great thing about art is people see it and they read these words which are, is only a template and then they take it and give it different riffs and different angles mm -hmm. they tell all the truth as Emily Dickinson said, said but they tell it slant and they give it their own slant and their own perspective and so what we're uh, currently focusing on and I think we're very close it's a final version of the script, and um, a, once we get the CD done, then a version of the CD where a theater company can do it and not have to have an amazing kick-ass band because Mark's doing all the tracks without vocals on it so mm -hmm. that uh, a theater company without access to a lot of musicians and a lot of great musicians as we have, mm -hmm. including Mark, of course, who is just the greatest <laughs> well i'm not you know i don't lie cheyenne truth um th that then they can rent uh, the soundtrack and have their own people sing it mm -hmm. and i think you know you were talking about joe uh you were originally thinking of him as a native american mm -hmm. and then uh, the first time we played it uh it was played by this kid uh who's combo of Filipino and German I think right and then when we cast it for the second time uh, James McGlann a yeah. black man was going to play the part he got sick and so we got uh, Mark Power Power uh, to do it and it, as we talked about it, it lets mm -hmm. us know that everyone anyone can play Joe yeah, Bean exactly it's, it's open to all ethnicities mm -hmm. to all people that live in this world. Right, right, right. So, um, but I, I think, you know, there's so many good things in it that, and I love the way that war is back in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was an important point there. Yeah. Is that uh, this, the week, I would say the week that this show was created uh, was the week that uh, oh, yeah. uh, Bush declared war, war on Iraq. Uh, the war on terrorism began, uh, you know, which I'm sure that we'll have for another 10 years at least. And we didn't uh, know that until, at the time. Until they come up with a different one. Right, until, there were rumblings about Iraq, but it had not been declared yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, right? Yeah, that was, was, that was the, the week that, that right. you know, like we were doing protests that same yeah. week here, you know, I mean. Yeah, and uh, then suddenly a song like Friendly Fire yeah. Then becomes so relevant, and it's relevant right now. Had you written Friendly Fire before the war was declared on Iraq? Um, yes, wasn't yes, that in? Yes, yes. Actually, because I remember the uh, what happened with that song is this friend of mine, Stephen Vegas, the same person who said that I was insane because I wrote all my, <laughs> my mother's songs as alto songs, uh, said, you know, because uh, I, I read the script to him, uh, to he and a couple other people sitting there and I just did a, a reading and uh, he's and that was all dialogue because that was that was one thing that we sort of had had gotten the idea from JB like the soldiers basically yeah. so we had these soldiers when there was really no reason for them to be in there <laughs> and we, I hadn't even equated our, all the stuff together yet really so he said he said um, you know it's really interesting but this is a 
this is a talk this is a really like talk heavy scene why don't you do a why don't you do like a like a jfk you like you know that hair song that where they use acronyms he said do an acronym song you know which i thought was a really good su suggestion and so he said you know here you know try try something that's like really you gotta have at least one super contemporary song so um so that, that was kind of like um i remember sitting there and the reason i know it's before the war is because i had no uh terminology yet like it, it was all made up like the hummer doing muckus was my <laughs> i had no idea that 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 because they're called humvees that they would start calling them hummers that was actually before and i was like i wonder if anybody's going to know what this means because they always call them humvees at yeah. least at that time yeah and and i'd kind of heard hummer but i didn't know if it was for military or what but but yeah so everything was like completely made up like the whole scenario was like oh that same week there was a really great picture in the new yorker i think or the atlantic no i think it was a new yorker of the heroic soldier that was like the vietnam era but it was it was like you know in vietnam the way they they sort of became caricatures yeah. you know like out in the jungle you yeah, know with yeah. the sort of like the joint in the mouth yeah. and and like but this one was kind of like the the modern version of that was sort of the desert camo and the okay. the the walkman right you know yeah, and yeah. and that really helped because that yeah. was like you know like what would what would uh tapes out, tapes out. okay <laughs> yeah that's Sorry. great do you want to throw another one yeah of course um <laughs> yeah that was weird